Welcome back to another Outdoor Philosophy. And today we are going to begin a new section. We're gonna talk a little bit about education. And um, this is actually quite a fascinating one because this is, I think, the oldest book on my to-read pile. I bought this in my senior year in college and it has been on my shelf waiting to be read ever since then. So yes, there is a time for everything. That was a long time ago. And um, we were in between books and I actually wanted to, it was a toss up between this or Closing of the American Mind, another great one in education by Alan Bloom. And uh, after a conversation on Thursday with a teenager who showed me the um, god awful, ridiculous, quote unquote, science simulator educator program that they had to use in their school, which was n completely mind numbing and totally incorrect as to what it is and does and works, I said, you know what? We need to talk about dumbing down our kids, which is gonna give me the chance to finally read this book. Now, there's, I don't know, like 20 some chapters, so we're not gonna do a single chapter, a single week. Uh, the sections might be a little too large, so I'll just kinda uh, piece together kind of thoughts as I'm reading through it. And I first learned about this book, actually, because way back in the early days of the internet, there was a list that went around which was supposedly came from Bill Gates. Well, that's actually not true. This list actually came from Charles Sykes, the author of this book. Now, Charles Sykes is an investigative journalist who focuses on education trends. And this book was published in 1995. And so it is looking at some of the things that shaped education in the direction where we're moving now. So this is a little bit before No Child Left Behind and the philosophies going into these. And I, I, as a former educator, looking at those trends, recognize how damning these trends were, that we are graduating students who don't even know anything about anything. I mean, really, it's hard to place knowledge on, on what some of these students learn. Not everyone, and there's some schools out there that do good. Um, definitely a lot of teachers that still do good, but then they get caught up in the ideology of the district, and every person that was an old colleague of mine or an old friend of mine who is still in the academic field wishes they got out. And in retrospect, I left the education field about 10 years ago, and it was probably the best decision I've ever made. But to start this out, this is actually that list of things. We're gonna read it. Um, it was written by Charles Sykes, not by Bill Gates, and it was originally published September 19th, 1996 in the San Diego Union Tribune. And it is titled, Some Rules Kids Won't Learn in School. And he writes, I'm um, just go ahead, go ahead and read this list to you. And this might be the introduction, might be the conclusion to what we talk about. So we'll actually dive into the book next week. He says, unfortunately, there are some things that children should be learning in school, but don't. Not all of them have to do with academics. As a modest back to school offering, here are some basic rules that may not have been found their way into the standard curriculum. Rule number one, life is not fair. Get used to it. The average teenager uses the phrase, it's not fair 8.6 times a day. You got it from your parents who said it so often, you decided it must be the most idealistic generation ever. When they started hearing it from their own kids, they realized rule number one. Number two, the real world won't care about your self-esteem as much as your school does. It'll expect you, that's the real world, will expect you to accomplish something before you feel good about yourself. This may come as a shock, usually when inflated self-esteem meets reality, kids complain it's not fair. Rule number three, sorry, you won't make $40,000 a year right out of high school. You won't be a vice president or have a car phone either. You may even have to wear a uniform that doesn't have the Gap label. Now, of course, you can tell this is a little bit dated because we do know that even elementary age kids tend to have car phones now. Of course, they just call them cell phones. <laughs> fun, fun, fun. Um, but yeah, the $40,000 a year vice president and, uh, you know, uh, the leader in the field, that's not going to happen. You need a little bit of life experience. Rule number four, if you think your teacher is tough, wait till you get a boss. He doesn't have tenure, so he tends to be a little bit edgier. When you screw up, he's not going to ask how you feel about it. Hmm. 
Number five, flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. This is a fascinating thing because just yesterday in the news, there was a alleged Instagram model, you know what that means, an Instagram model whose account was banned because of spam. And she comes onto her YouTube channel of 4,000 subscribers and cries, I have no opportunity. My, my, my Instagram is gone. True story. True story. Think about that. Flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Your grandparents had a different word for burger flipping. They called it opportunity. They weren't embarrassed making minimum wage either. They would have to be embarrassed to sit around talking about Kurt Cobain all weekend. Of course, replace Kurt Cobain with whoever's popular today. You can tell. This is 1996. Man, Nirvana was a big deal. Um, in fact, if I remember, I think this was shortly after his death, maybe right around his death. All right, rule number six. It's not your parents' fault. If you screw up, you are responsible. This is the flip side of it's my life and you're not the boss of me and other eloquent proclamations of your generation. When you turn 18, it's on your dime. Don't whine about it or you'll sound like a baby boomer. Rule number seven. Before you were born, your parents weren't as boring as they are now. They got this way paying your bills, cleaning up your room, and listening to you telling them how idealistic you are. And by the way, before you save the rainforest from the blood-sucking parents of your own parents' generation, try delousing the closet in your own bedroom. Um, this has actually become intensified as of recent years. In the last two decades since this was written, this has become far more intensified. 96, 06, 16. Wow, it's over two decades. Um, and so we are in a society right now of such idealism. It's kind of vomitous. Uh, rule number eight, your school may have done away with winners and losers. Life hasn't. In some schools, they'll give you as many times as you want to get the right answer. Failing grades have been abolished and class valedictations are scrapped, lest anyone's feelings be hurt. Effort is as important as results. This, of course, bears not the slightest resemblance to anything in real life. See rules number one, two, and four. It's on the wrong, wrong rule there. All right, rule number nine. Life is not divided into semesters and you don't get summers off, not even Easter breaks. They expect you to show up every day for eight hours and you don't get a new life every 10 weeks. It just goes on and on. While we're at it, very few jobs are interested in fostering your self-expression or helping you find yourself. Fewer still lead to self-realization. This is an important one to discuss as we're in this, this crazy culture of, uh, of this woke generation where these people, they, they just want everything and they're not really willing to work for it. It's kind of interesting. And they just think that everything's got to be idealist and that's not right. Rule number 10, television, you could replace that with YouTube probably, is not real life. Your life is not a sitcom. Your problems, uh, maybe not YouTube, I don't know, maybe the direction of trying to take it. Um, but anyway, um, television is not real life. Your life is not a sitcom. Your problems will not be solved in 30 minutes, minus the time for commercials. In real life, people actually have to leave the coffee shop and go to, jo to jobs. Your friends will not be as perky or as pliable as Jennifer Aniston. Hmm. Interesting. And that's kind of demonstrates that solutions aren't always easy. Neither is education. As we read through this, there's definitely some things I agree with his book and there's definitely some things I disagree with his book, although I generally tend to lean more in agreement. Uh, rule number 11, be nice to nerds. You may end up working for them. We all could. Hmm. Rule number 12, smoking does not make you look cool. I will add vaping does not make you look cool. It makes you look like a moronic. Next time you're out cruising, watch an 11 year old with a butt in his mouth or a vape pen in his mouth. That's what you look like to anyone over 20. Ditto for expressing yourself with purple hair and or pierced body parts. Rule number 13, you're not immortal. See rule number 12. If you are under the impression that living fast, dying young, and leaving a beautiful corpse is romantic, 
then obviously you haven't seen one of your peers at room temperature lately. Very true. Very true. We have sheltered and insulated our current generation from everything potentially traumatic. And they're as fragile as saplings. They could die at any touch, which is why we have people running around screaming to dox and hurt people because they wear a red hat that maybe says, make America great again. That's called intolerance, people, and prejudice, yeah. Rule number 14, well, you uh, enjoy this while you can. Sure, parents are a pain, school's a bother, and life is depressing, but someday you'll realize how wonderful it was to be a kid. Maybe you should start now. You are welcome. All right, so that's, that's an interesting list, and I saw that list a long time ago and I printed it out. I actually used to hang it outside the um, outside my dorm door where I was a live-in tutor for the sciences and of course I had to replace it about every other day. People did not like that. They liked tearing it down. So let's go ahead and talk briefly about the book. I will have a link for this down below if you want to pick up a copy. I think we're already over 10 minutes so uh, I'm not going to dive into the very beginnings. Um, but what we are going to do here is we are going to um, we're going to go ahead and dive into this. I'm going to do the whole section one together, which is about 30 pages. I'll probably break section two into uh, two or three sections, which is um, a lot of the a lot of the concepts around dumbing down our schools. It just really goes into a lot of the um, a lot of the little uh, little details. Um, then we have section three is moral dumbing down. We'll probably do that one as a single section as it's 30 pages. And then the attack on learning. That looks like it's an easy one. So I don't know. We're, I'm guessing maybe we'll do maybe eight videos in total is my guess uh, without uh, going through the whole thing. So uh, that is dumbing down our kids. We'll be talking about the, the general trend, the general push, the general pull. Of course, again, where he's kind of focusing on is... Uh, he's going to look at this book about how we're not spending enough real time on real academics, which in a reality is definitely true. Uh, I remember mentoring a kid a long time back and kids spent more time in a counselor's office than he spent in a classroom in any given day at school. And he like, it was li literally like, are you trying to hold him back? I finally got in there. Um, I finally got in there with all these all these school board people with their master's degrees, and uh, his mother signed a consent form that I could go in and sit in on the on the meeting to talk about his his specific strategic plan. And I went in there and I opened up the plan and all this. And one of the person tried the I got a master's degree, and I looked at her and said, "Well, I got a doctor's degree. So if we're going to talk about the play the education game, I think I win." Um, and I said, you know, these programs require a certain thing. Has the teacher done this, this, and this according to the program and the documents I'm holding in front of me? And the answer came back, no, and we dismissed immediately. And I said, I'm sorry, you have to treat this kid according to his plan. And that's kind of the, the thing is that, that there's 50-50s there's on this. It's, there's, I don't agree with everything he's going to say because his entire final argument is we need to sit down and do so much study on academics and then they have to go home and literally spend every bit of time at home also working on academics. I don't agree with that model. In fact, the kid that I know now, he's so busy with his schoolwork, he can't focus on the things that he has to do to be successful. He is going to be delayed over a year in his career because his homework is keeping him too busy. And that is also a fallacy and an error. Um, but ultimately what his view is, is looking at the, first of all is the modern thing that became the no child left behind. But the second principle is how too many schools are too focused on making kids feel good and not focused enough on actually teaching kids academics. And that's kind of where we're gonna be getting at. So we will come back next time with a, um, with a video um, introducing the first section of this. So uh, pick up a copy of that book if you can. I'll have a link in the description down below. And uh, join us for this outdoor philosophy series.